You guys get to sit right in front. Okay. Yeah, we're ready. That's great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, meeting of the Hand Eyes Fly Curiosity Club. We're your hosts this evening. I'm Tobias, and this is Will. Uh, together, we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. <laughs> As attendees of the Hand Eyes Fly Curiosity Club, you're all now members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiosity, Ciencia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual novice. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance <laughs> of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Curiosity Club is made merrier by our fellow artisans of Fort George Brewery in Astoria, Oregon, and we're very thankful for it. Let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Sarah Merck, journalist, author, and feminist podcast host. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Like I said, I'm Sarah. Uh, I am a journalist. I work for Bitch Media, the feminism and pop culture nonprofit here in town. Um, and I work in a bunch of different mediums. And my favorite medium, potentially, is zines. So that's what I'm here to talk to you tonight about. Um, zines, uh, has anyone here, who in here has made a zine ever in their life? Okay, we have five people, six people. So this is going to be really exciting because by the end of tonight, you will all have made a zine, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, I like to know where things are going, so here's the lay of the land. It's okay. Was that a ghost or God or just you? Um, I'm going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to do uh, a hopefully anxiety-free free writing exercise. And then Becky, special helper in back, hi Becky, is going to take the pages that we will create from that writing exercise, run them over to a photocopier, photocopy them, bring them back, and at the end of tonight we will all have a copy of that zine to have and to hold as our very own. In that end 15 minutes where Becky's photocopying, uh, we can hang out, and I brought a bunch of zines from my personal collection uh, to read. And that's what's sitting in front of you right now. These are all zines I've acquired over the last eight years or so. Some of them are special to me. Um, lots of, actually, all of them are special to me. Some of them are made by me, and most of them are made by other people. Okay, number one question. What is a zine? So, zine, of course, is short for magazine. And this is a definition from the Barnard zine library, which you don't have to read all of. I just put it up there in case you're an overachiever. Basically, it's like a small press publication that's made for the goal uh, of expression or documentation, but not explicitly profit. And you don't make very many copies of it, but you make some copies of it. And they can take all different forms. The key thing to note from this long-winded definition of a zine is that this comes from a zine printed in the zine capital of the United States, Portland, Oregon. That's right. We're the zine capital of the United States. Maybe you didn't even know it. Um, so because zines are an archaic technology, I wanted to talk about why would you make a zine? Why does it bring me such a joy? And what are the reasons to make a zine and go about doing that? Um, reason number one is that zines are great for self-expression on the cheap. So if you don't have a lot of money, but you have some stuff to say or share, a zine is a great way to do it. Um, there are a couple examples of ones that I've made around the table, but here's one that I made most recently, which I turned 30 last month, uh, and I wanted to do for my 30th birthday to do some sort of reflection and documentation about being in my 20s. And so I spent a week drawing lessons that I learned from my 20s, 30 lessons from my 20s, and I made it into this zine that then I can share and give to people. Um, and it's a great way to express my ideas and feelings without having to spend a lot of money on it. Uh, there's a bunch of like people that get started making zines as a way to experiment with stuff and then wind up turning them into books or other projects or sometimes the zine is the end goal itself. So up here I have two, cop I have two versions of this. One is this cool little zine that I got years ago from my friend Michael Hild called Goodbye to the Nervous Apprehension which was a chapter from a book he was apparently writing. But at the time, he just printed this little zine of it and was handing it out to people. And then like five years later, he made it into an actual book. And so it was a cool way to experiment with like, hey, I have stuff to share, I have an idea to do it, but I don't necessarily have the time or capital or connections to make a book about it yet. 
Another one that probably a lot of you have seen, have you seen these, uh, how do you talk to your cat about evolution or how to talk to your cat about gun safety? <laughs> this is also made by a Portlander, Zachary Auburn. Um, and he put out these for years and then he just got a book deal and the book version of this comes out today. Yes. So look it up. Um, it's really great. It's full of, it's kind of like a satirical right wing pamphlet about uh, evolution, abstinence, and gun safety. And so those are two, those are just two examples of ways that, um, I'll put this over here, um, people have taken their projects and sort of like experimented with them as a zine and then turned them into a book. Though a lot of times the zine is the end goal itself and that's uh, just what you're looking for. Um, another example of that is the place where I work, Bitch, where we started 20 years ago as a zine printed in somebody's basement. So in San Francisco, so three people, this is a terrible photo of the first copy of Bitch and it hangs above my desk, I stare at it every day. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a woman sitting at a table watching TV and she says, you talking to me? <laughs> These are the humble beginnings of Bitch. <laughs> um, which, this is like a hand drawn, run off on a photocopier in somebody's basement because they had something to say. They were watching TV and watching movies and reading the newspaper and feeling really upset about it and didn't feel like they had a lot of outlets for expression. So they made their own outlet for expression with a zine and it didn't take much money and they sold them for a dollar. And 20 years later, it's a national publication. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you okay? Um, and so that's another example of like, you can experiment with stuff in zines really well and you don't necessarily need a huge platform in order to put them out there. So it can be a really democratic way to publish your thoughts and ideas, even now when there's online publishing tools. So that's the other question is why, if you can publish your thoughts on Facebook or Instagram or on Medium or any of those sites, it's easier now than ever to publish your own work. Why would you make it into a zine? I would say, <laughs> because I like that zines share ideas and fun and accessible ways. And so, for example, uh, this scene that I have is a collection of police records uh, about critical mass, the bike protest here in Portland. And uh, what it does is it compiles all of the police records that ever talked about the critical mass protest um, over the course of about five years and prints it up as this little zine. And this is something that you could get online and probably if there was like a database of it somewhere, maybe I would look at it. But zines make it a fun thing that you might pick up and be like, oh, what is that? I haven't thought about that. That's interesting. Um, and th these are really interesting things to read that you might not actually seek out on your own. Uh, did I put up a picture? Oh yeah, another good example is this project that I worked on uh, that there's a bunch of examples of around the table called Oregon History Comics. And these are something that I thought up about six years ago. I went to a talk and I thought, you know, there's that about how the demographics are changing in Portland and how the majority of Portlanders were not, had not grown up here. And I was like, wow, we don't really learn a lot about our history. As somebody who just moved here, I was interested in making a history project that would be broadly accessible to my friends and to other people who might not seek out that history. And so I started putting together these little zines and uh, I put together 10 little known and marginalized stories from Oregon's past. I wrote them all. I ran the scripts past historians, and then 10 different artists illustrated them all. And so they have become a really cool way where that information exists in books or in the History Museum um, or in documentaries, but making it a comic, making it a cute little thing helps it reach people who might not seek that out. Um, there's also zines that I've picked up about face blindness and computer programming and like heavy scientific topics that there's these great little zines about um, that can really make that kind of information accessible and fun. So that's one good reason. Um, also, like all print media, they're special to give and they're special to get. Um, I have, let me see what I have. <laughs> okay, so this is something that I've held on to for 15 years. It is my high school literary journal. Does anybody else work on their like high school poetry journal? Shout out to those people in the back row. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is something that we put together when I was in high school and it's full of like my really like sad poems and emotional poetry and drawings and um, it's something that 
that's, that sort of ephemera existed, but putting it together in a zine in a, in a, in a print format makes it special, makes it something to hold on to. And a lot of the zines you'll see around the table are this way, where they're really art objects. They're something that uh, is special because it's not digital. It's special because it's in your hands um, and you can look at it. And there's a bunch of different formats you can use for zines. There's a zine in the back that's like in a bag of, that says like Colt 40 on it. It looks like it's a brown bag zine. Can you hold that up, David? So that's like a really cool way to print it. So it's in this paper bag instead of in a regular book binding. And it's this zine inside there. Um, there's one up in front that has a library card on the front. And here's another, do you wanna hold that one up? So that one has a cool binding where on the front it looks like it's this library card. So that's something that's a really cool thing that you can do because it's a special print art object. Thanks. This is another zine I think is really awesome that's made by a Portland artist. Whoa. And it spreads out like this. This is an accordion style zine. Um, and let me put that back together again. And on the end it has these uh, copper printed plates. And the whole thing uh, is different, is like selections from the, the Portland archives, uh, the historical archives that's about this protest that happened in 1978 and talks about the reasons for women participating in that protest and for women participating in protest movements. And it's lines taken from um, newspaper articles written about the protests and police reports about the protests, specifically about the women who were in that protest. And so this is like a really beautiful art object that this artist put together. And I just think it's really cool to look at and cool to hold and something you would want to like hold on to that's a special gift. I'll put this up here. Um, last one is that for me, zines build community. They're a cool way to share ideas and feelings and thoughts and to document something that is going on in a way that you can share and hold on to. Um, one example of this, I was editing this article recently about radical cheerleaders. Does anybody know about radical cheerleaders? Nobody? Oh, geez, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> right, well, this is interesting because radical cheerleaders were like a protest were like a, uh, a, a protest performance art style that basically was pretty big for about five years and pretty much existed for about 10 years from the mid 90s to the mid 2000s. And this is something where uh, men and women would dress up and, and gender queer people would dress up in sort of fake cheerleader outfits or just super femme outfits and go to protests and do protest chants, you know. So, um, you know, instead of doing the regular cheerleader chants, they would twist them and change them to make them about uh, you know, environmental act activism or about like kicking out the mayor or whatever it was, just cheerleader chants at the protest. And so, but this is one that's like largely kind of disappeared. And so somebody for Bitch was writing an article about the history of radical cheerleaders and what's happening to them now, where did they go? I was a radical cheerleader in college, obviously. So <laughs> um, I was like, man, there, we need some like, documentation to show the community that was going on around this movement that's like largely disappeared and there's not like a really strong record of. Luckily, uh, the radical cheerleaders like printed their, a lot, a lot of groups printed their cheers as zines, as little booklets that they would give out. And those are archived by the Queer Zine Archive Project. So a lot of the zines were scanned in and made digital and you can search them online. So I was able to get really cool graphics that people handed out at protests in the mid 90s uh, from those zines. Including this one, Radical Cheers of Philly. It says, I'm sexy, I'm cute, political to boot. I'm bitchin', I care, so go ahead and stare. <laughs> and on and on and on. And so I think this is really cool because it's a way that these zines built this community um, and because they're archived and because we can still find them, we can still see what that community was like. Otherwise, it might have disappeared. I think about this a lot when I'm thinking about the ways people provide commentary today. Like, is anybody going around and archiving Facebook comments or Twitter posts? I don't think they are, but I, so I think we're going to lose a lot of that kind of uh, interaction and the special parts of our culture that it would be great to have documented copies of. Some other examples of zines building community. Oh yeah, where, so a lot of libraries are, doc, are archiving zines, including Multnomah County Library. This is me at the Portland Zine Symposium, which is an annual event that happens every summer where like hundreds of zinesters get together. And the Multnomah County Library goes there and they table and they buy a bunch of people's zines because they want to archive them, they want to have them for the historical record. So this, I was really excited because at the library's table was a zine that I had made that's now in the library collection. <laughs> 
And so I'm holding it up there and I'm like super excited because I'm like, look, my zine's in the library. Now it's going to have posterity. Um, and there's other places that are doing that. This is my friend Lillian Karabaik at the Independent Publishing Resource Center, which has uh, one of the largest zine libraries in the country. So they are actively uh, like archiving zines and documenting zines. Um, they, had, they do like a 24-hour archiving marathon once a year, and I went, every, every time I've gone, it's been awesome because you find gems from like zines published in suburban Minnesota from 20 years ago, and you're like, wow, it's such a good artifact. Um, this is another photo of the IPRC. It's, on, it's currently on 11th and Division, and I would, if you're looking for zines in Portland, that's the place to go and check it out, to make your own or to read other people's. Um, another interesting zine that, uh, aspect of zines building community is that this is not necessarily something that's new. Zines are thought of as like being published in like the 70s and 80s, really tied to punk culture, tied to punk fandoms. Zines, like modern zines arose um, out of sci-fi fandoms, and so in the like 1930s and 40s. So <laughs> when there was sci-fi pulp books, people would write their own, what we would now call fan fiction about those sci-fi books or reviews of those sci-fi books and printed up their own sci-fi fanzines that they would distribute around the country. Um, but lots of people made what we now call zines in all sorts of different forms, including one of my favorite zine stories is about the uh, Portland shipyards on Swan Island during World War II. So this is a photo of the shipyards during World War II, and there was thousands of workers that came to Portland and worked at those shipyards. Here's a couple photos of like badass women working in the shipyards during World War II. Um, and the workers had a zine that was made by uh, the sort of leadership of uh, the, the company. And that zine was called, oh yeah, and their, and their zine was called, but then the, the workers also had their own zine that was called The Finger. And so there was like kind of like the boss zine that was put out um, that talked about you know, people who were hired and their families, lots of like news and updates on all the ships they were building. They built a hundred ships during the course of the three years at Swan Island. So they would like give updates on how many ships were made and what had happened. And the workers, an anonymous group of workers had their own zine called The Finger. Um, so the, the one that was run by, the zine that was made by, uh, that was like approved by the leadership. Oh yeah, this is all from this, uh, this is documented by this guy, the one true Bix online. He wrote a bunch of blog posts about it. You can find them here. That's where I'm taking this stuff from. Um, look that up. Uh, so the, the leadership zine was called Boston's Whistle, which I believe is Boston's Whistle. And they said this about the finger that they didn't know where it came from, um, but that it was reputedly published by a dwarf living under a dugout of the outfitting dock. And this paper put the finger on employees not pitching in to meet the launching deadlines. Cartoons and posters by workmen helped build morale among Swan Island workers. So it was this kind of like satirical anonymous publication that was put out making jokes about people who worked on the, in Swan Island, publishing comics, publishing weird little poems, basically just like, a, like basically the high school literary journal equivalent for uh, shipyard workers during World War II. Uh, here's one more quote from The Finger in December 1943. It ran from 1942 to 1943, and it says, The old lady, which is a ship, is turning out to be a champ, speeding through war waters to her new accomplishments. She probably chuckles to herself, if the boys back home could see me now. So there's lots of, like, boat jokes, <laughs> which I don't really get, um, but that the, work, the workers were into. So that's a scene that was published documenting a specific community and helping build community in this one specific place at this one specific time. And now we can go to the archives of the Oregon Historical Society and look, and look through it ourselves. Oh yeah, one more thing from the, uh, from the finger. They're talking about who anonymously published it. Um, they said that the Kaiser, the company that ran the shipyards, has reserved only two rights, that of canning the editor and stopping publication if our rag might get too rough. Uh, we, ha we haven't been and won't be a mighty publication, but we can put the finger on the guy who isn't producing. I just, I just love this thing because uh, I like thinking about like, like, you know, like really tough, badass shipyard workers like making this satirical publication in the meantime and like distributing it anonymously. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're getting to the point where we're gonna each make a page of a collective zine. So. Transition yourself mentally into the place where we're, what we're all going to do is make one page of the zine that we're, then we're going to collect them all, take them to the photocopier, and print them as a whole thing. 
So we need to talk about some basics of zine design. This is pretty much it. So as you can see from the zines that are on the table, you can have writing and drawing. You can have pictures and not pictures. You can have things you've cut out and glued in, or you can just draw it yourself and write it yourself. There's no rules in that regard. These are my really only three rules. Uh, you need to have a margin because otherwise it will run off the page. Um, let me see an example of that. Oh yeah, this is a little zine that I made at the IPRC. We did a talk, like a, a discussion forum last year about science fiction and social justice and the intersections of science fiction and social justice. And so to document that event, we had everyone, we put together this thing. This is uh, with uh, the scholar and lecturer, Walida Amarisha, uh, who wrote this book called Octavia's Brood, which is awesome about science fiction and social justice. So to document that, we had everybody at the event write one page, one entry in the People's Encyclopedia of 2070. So in 2070, what's going to be in the encyclopedia? What's going to be there? Let me see. Uh, so somebody did one page. Their entry is border, archaic. And they talk about how the borders of the world have disappeared in 2070. You can see this page is great because it's got a clear margin that they drew. And then they did it in black and white so it can photocopy well. And then uh, they wrote pretty legibly. Let's see what another entry is. Uh, that's really nice. Uh, oh, this, this is an entry for name-based personal pronouns. And they wrote, after gendered personal pronouns fell out of common use and style, they were replaced with the current system. I think that's really cool. That's a page from 2070 Encyclopedia. So you can see we've got that clear margin, black and white, legible handwriting. Um, so that's what we're going to do in about five minutes. We're going to each make a page. Um, let's talk for one brief minute about anxiety. Uh, because <laughs> <laughs> everyone, when they get started writing or drawing, has massive anxiety and is like, I'm staring at this blank page. What do I do with it? I'm terrible at everything. I can't write. I can't draw. I suck at this. Ugh. So I want you to take this opportunity to recognize that and put it aside because it doesn't have to be good. That's one of the great things about zines is that they don't really cost us anything. So we can make them bad. So embrace your ability to make something shitty and feel good about it. Um, so what we're going to do for the first, what I'm going to do is hand out blank paper, and we're going to do a timed exercise where everyone, as an anxiety reduction and eradication strategy, we're going to have to draw a bunch of things really quickly so you like get it out of your system, and then we're all going to spend about 15 minutes making a page for the zine, and I'll tell you the theme of that after we do the first steps. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so if you have a pen on you, grab a pen. If you don't have a pen, don't worry, I brought a bunch. Here's some pens. And here's some paper. Hey you guys, you might want a, something to, to draw on or a seat at the table. Do you have things? Here's some paper. 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 Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there's a bunch up here. Hang on. I don't know. Do any of these work for you? Great. Thanks. Okay. Does everyone have does everyone have at least one sheet of paper and at least one pen? Yes. Man, we're doing so well. Excellent. OK. So fold your piece of paper in half like this. Noink. And so these are the just experimental anxiety eradication strategy free drawings that we're going to do. And the idea that is that we go, I'm going to say this is timed so that we have to do it fast so that it doesn't, it's not going to be perfect so that it's going to suck. The idea is that it's going to be bad. So then you will feel OK about being bad. Um, so, OK, the first one is that over the next 60 seconds, try and draw five dogs of any type, shape, whatever that means to you, five dogs starting now. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, you have 15 more seconds. Okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> Here's my dogs. <laughs> um, on the other half of the paper, okay, we have 60 more seconds. Uh, draw five homes. Homes, whatever that means. Could be houses, could be nests, I don't know. Starting homes, starting now. Okay, and stop. Okay, here's my five homes. I made one of them a hobbit hole. <laughs> Doesn't really look like a hobbit hole, but that's fine. This one's an igloo. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our anti-anxiety situation. Uh, now you need a new sheet of paper. Ta -da. A whole new sheet of paper. Does anybody have one? Okay, paper is not precious here. And now we're going to commence uh, for the next 10 minutes. We're going to each make a page of the zine. So remember, the first thing you want to do is fold it in half like this, boink, and make your page. The first thing you're going to do, remember, can we go back, is write a margin. So you can do that however you want. I would personally just draw it on there like that. Because otherwise, it's going to get eaten up by the photocopier and it's going to get cut off. So the first thing you do is draw a margin. You don't need to put your name on it or any other thing unless you want to. And the prompt for this thing, that it's going to take us 10 minutes, I'll put on some music, we can do it together, um, is describe something you have lost. So for me, I could draw a picture of that. I could just write about it, like a free write. Or I could write and draw, whichever you prefer. So we're going to take 10 minutes and do this. And when you finish it, come up and just put it right here. And we'll um, put it into our collective zine. Does everybody understand the situation? Excellent. Let's do it. I'm going to put on some music. <laughs> Hey, Tobias, how would I get music to work? 